good weekend. I'm a little bit tired and I just want to lay here and not think. So I put it on, I think Netflix or Hulu or something. And I, I for some reason, went to cartoons, cartoon movies. And I used to love watching those with my kids when they were younger. And I hadn't seen a lot of the ones that have come out in the last few years because my kids are much older now. But I came across one called Lorax, and it's a Dr. Seuss uh, movie. And I thought, you know what? I, I'm going to watch that. And then as soon as I started, I'm like, this is stupid. I'm not going to sit here for two hours and watch a cartoon. But it was like something would not let me turn that channel. I just, this is going to sound crazy, but I just felt like I was supposed to watch it. That maybe that even in that cartoon, there was a message for me. And I have walked with the Lord long enough to know that he speaks to me in the craziest ways. And I'm not calling him crazy. I'm just saying there, there let me say unique ways. <laughs> I don't offend anybody, but just a very unique way. So I can be walking and I see a blade of grass and, and God will just show me something about himself or something about myself or about people in general through that blade of grass. And that's what happened through that movie Lorax last night. I got to watch it. And if you haven't watched it, it's, it's, it's a cute little movie. It's, it's about a town that um, didn't have any trees. It was a plastic town that basically it was a bubble. And the man who ran the town, he, I can't even remember what his name was, but he sold air. So you could imagine um, he sold air so everybody could breathe and they didn't have to breathe the smog that was outside the bubble of the city that had resulted in all the trees being cut down. And so the whole story is about um, replanting trees and social responsibility and things like that. But all the trees had um, disappeared in this town because one man came and he cut one down and he developed this product called a I think it was called a feed, he says, because everybody needs a feed. And it was, it could just, it was clothing. He would take part of the trees and make these items that people would go and buy. Well, greed got a hold of him because he started making all this money and becoming famous. And the story just goes and goes and everything's great. And all of a sudden he cuts down the last tree and it's gone. And so this little boy meets the man who had cut down all the trees, Mr once or something like that is just it's kind of hard to explain but this little boy wants to find out what happened to all the trees and he hears the story and this man had lived with all this guilt and he says um he starts encouraging that that boy can make a difference that maybe he was the one that could replant the tree replant a seed that would then um, grow into a great harvest and this line that you see behind me, when that that older man that was up in this tree, Mr. Once, Onceler, he um, when he said this to that little boy or young teen, whatever it was, that was a cartoon. I can't tell ages of cartoon people. Uh, but this is what he said to him because the little boy's like, what difference could I make? And here's what he said. He said, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's just not. It's not. And when it said that, I felt like that's what the whole the Holy Spirit wanted me to watch that whole movie for that line. Unless someone like you, unless someone like you, Christy, unless someone like you, Pat, unless someone like you, Michelle or Shannon, whoever's watching this tonight, those are some of my, my friends that are usually on here um, a lot. I can't see who's watching, but unless you, my friend, care a whole awful lot about something, nothing's ever going to change. It's not. It's just not. And so that just really jumped out at me because, like I said, I, I had a message. I don't know if I said this. I said it earlier today. I had a message all planned out tonight about losing the weight of fear. But I just felt like in light of everything that's happening in our society right now with the riots, with the um, the passing of that young man, uh, Mr. George, um, I just feel like I need to speak into this from a Christian perspective and kind of get in your business like the Lord's gotten in my business and encourage you, not condemn, but encourage you and to encourage myself 
to start to care a whole awful lot about what's going on in this world. It's just amazing to me how we had all the COVID-19 from the beginning of year to like right around the end of May and everybody just had to stay in their house. And then all of a sudden it was like something was just unleashed and it, it was nothing new. It's something that's been going on, um, underlying racism and prejudice and, and it's just a fire got lit and it's raging. And I, I hope that tonight I'm trying to guard my words to make sure I don't, I, I know I'll probably offend somebody, but I just want to speak from my heart because as I watch the TV and, and the news, my heart is just so grieved. It was so grieved at the first half of the year because of the fear that was instilled in us because of this virus. And here's what I know. God is not a God of fear. He is not, a, he is not give us a spirit of fear says in 2 Timothy 1, 7, but he gives us a spirit of love, not fear, love, a sound mind and power so that we can go into this world and change it. See, Paul was writing to Timothy and Timothy was a, there was a lot of persecution. There was a lot going on in the church and people were, he was young and even Timothy at times didn't think he could make a difference. And Paul told him, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. And in essence, he's saying, God has called you. God has equipped you. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is inside of you, Timothy. And it's also inside of me. And it's inside of you. Whoever's watching this today or tomorrow or a year from now, God's Holy Spirit is in you. And recently I've been reading, you know, Hebrews 12 and um, not Hebrews 12. We've been doing a study on Hebrews 12, but Ephesians 3. I've been studying Ephesians and Ephesians 3.20 talks about that God is a God of more. That's our theme verse for this whole more Monday, that God can do abundantly more than we can ever hope for or imagine or ever think. But what we miss in that verse is the first part. We always say, God is able to do abundantly more than I could ever imagine or hope for or dream about. But the reality, it says that God's spirit working in you, through you, can do abundantly more than you can ever hope for or imagine. To me, I believe this verse is not just saying God is a powerful God, but God's power in you and in me that works through us and in us is so powerful that God can use you, your life, to do amazing things. Just like in Lorax that Mr. Wunsler was saying to that, that little boy, you just might be the one who can make a difference. We all can make a difference, but the key is we got to care. We have to care. That would be a little bit better English. We've got to care. I, re I remember one day I was, when we lived back in Keystone Heights, Florida, I was driving down my driveway. We just, we've always had great neighbors. Thank goodness. We've had a couple of not so great ones, but that was a long time ago. So don't anybody in Claremont think was y'all's or even the last few places we lived in Keystone. But there, there's, um, but there's a, a, one neighbor in particular, he was always just blessing us. I think he, Maybe our yard looks so messy. I don't know, but <laughs> he was just always up in there piddling in it. And I came home one day and Tommy was on our roof and he's blowing off our leaves. And he was retired and he knew we traveled a lot and had young kids. And, and he was just up there, just, just going crazy with that. Bar. And I said, Lord, would you bless Tommy? Thank you for Tommy. And I heard this so quickly. I heard the Holy Spirit say, you bless him. You bless them because you're my hands and you're my feet and you're my voice. And God has called us to change things. God has called us to move. God has called us to bless people, to give to people, to encourage people, to um, open up doors, not just physical doors, but doors of opportunity for people that's why he created us all. We're a body that works together. And if one part of the body's not doing their part, 
then it doesn't function like I should. But a lot of people think I can't make a difference. Anybody can make a difference. And God is calling us to do something. God is calling us to move. God is calling us not just to sit back and be idle and just, we have watched so much TV in the last six months, news, finding out what's going to happen with this virus, finding out, and, and in the meantime, people are, are hungry, they're without jobs, and, and I'm just as guilty, I'm just in my home, and I'm watching TV, and now we're watching the riots, and we're like, I feel like I'm doing nothing. I'm praying, and praying is important, but for the most part, it's almost like we sit back and we watch all this, and it's almost like we're armchair quarterbacks. We, we, you know, you talking about the people who watch like NFL games. If NFL comes back on in the fall, I, I, my husband every time football starting up, he always sings, "It's the most wonderful time of the year," and I know it's football season, but. Thank goodness my husband is not an armchair quarterback. He never yells at the TV, he just sits there, he watches, and he knows the game. But, but And he played it. He played in college. But there's a lot of people that watch from the sidelines and they criticize. And they, they just always are saying what should have been done. And, and this person should have done that. And that call should have been made. And this play should have been run. And that person shouldn't have fumbled the ball. And reality is the person sitting there is just sitting on the couch with a beer in their hand doing nothing, eating chips. But that's what a lot of us do, spiritually speaking, as believers. We're armchair quarterbacks. We sit and we watch this world go to hell in a handbasket and we don't do anything. And so I'm a little bit fired up tonight because I'm asking God, God, show me what I can do. God, I want to care an awful lot. I want to be one of the people that cares a whole awful lot about something so I can make a, go make a difference in this world. And unless I do, and unless you do, nothing will change. And it's going to take us moving behind it, from behind the TV and, and maybe go to the street, not to loot, not to hold up a picket sign, but to love, to love people to wholeness. You know, the Bible is so clear in Second Chronicles 7, I believe it's 14. No, uh, yeah, 14. God is saying to his children, to the Israelites, he's saying, then if my people who are called by my name, today's language, that would be Christians, people who call themselves Christians. And all of you have heard this verse, I am sure. It's been quoted a lot lately. But it says, if you are called by my name, if you call yourself a Christian, if you will humble yourself and you will pray, a lot of times we just, we stop and we say, we just need to humble ourselves and pray. But it also says, seek God's face and turn from our wicked ways. Have you ever thought about that it is wicked not to do something? That it is wicked to have prejudice? It is to, to be racist, to sit back and not be a part of the solution? Bible says in James, I believe it's James 417 to him who knows what to do and doesn't do it it's sin it's sin and so God is calling us to action he's calling us to first of all humble ourselves and say God I know that there is a problem here and I know I've been a part of the problem and unless we realize that we can say I can say to I'm blue in the face that I'm not prejudiced but there are some people groups that I am prejudiced toward, and I don't want to be. I mean, if I see a person that with a certain lifestyle, I might be prejudiced against them. And God's saying, don't show favoritism. Don't you look at the outside. God looks at the heart. And you pray for that person. You love that person, no matter who they are no matter what color of their skin, no matter if they're male or female, no matter if they're from Russia or the Ukraine or Siberia or um, Mexico or China or wherever, Serbia, wherever they're from, you love them because they are a child of God. They were created in the image of God. Every person you see is created in the image of God. And just because we have white skin or black skin or brown skin, you know, God, when I think of that, that song, 
Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. I lost it for a second. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I was taught that in Sunday school at Grace Church here in Greenville, North Carolina. But I'm here to tell you, and I'm not talking about grace. I'm talking about churches in general are some of the most segregated places in this world and the most prejudiced places in this world. And it should not be. Not only are we prejudiced and, and segregate and separate because of our color or maybe even our age and maybe even our style of music, but for our, our denominations and we are not unified and where something is divided, guess what? It crumbles and it falls and God is calling us to unify, to unify as Christians, as believers, to unify as people. We are called to humble ourselves, to realize there is a problem, to realize that we have been a part of the problem. Like I said a, a couple of minutes ago before I got on a little tangent, I can say until I'm blue in the face that I'm not prejudiced, but I, I have ingrained in me growing up in the South prejudice mindsets that I don't even know are there. I, I remember going, and I'm going to just, this is terrible, but I'm just I'm very authentic with you. I remember going yard selling and, and saying to this man, it was a white man. I, I, he wouldn't come down in his price. And I said, I can't juke you down. I always thought it was juke. Like you were hitting down, but it was do you down. Like it was slapping. It, it was, what's the word? It was making fun of Jewish people. And I didn't even have an idea. I had no idea, but that's something I had heard, and I didn't know it was making fun of Jewish people, and what was so bad is that man was Jewish, and I offended him. So there are things that we have in us that, one, we might do that we didn't even mean, but it's just in us because of where we've been raised, and I'm not saying that's my parents, so I'm just saying I grew up in the South. And even, you know, in the last week and listening to conversations of people that I know and I'm hearing, you know, he's a white person and that's a, that black folk did this and the white person did this. And I'm like, why do we even have to say white? Why do we have to say black? And I, I know we're a lot of times we're describing people, but sometimes it's used to, to separate people. And so I just ask us to first and foremost, to humble ourselves and say, God, you show me my part of the problem, where I'm a part of the problem. And when he shows you, ask him to forgive you and ask him to give you a love that only the Holy Spirit can give that can overcome prejudice. I get letters from so many inmates, thousands and thousands of inmates that we minister to through our Victorious Living magazine. You can find out more about that on victoriouslivingmagazine.com. But a lot of those talk about, you know, the separation of, of races in prison. And you got to, you got to join a, a, a gang. You got to join a people group when you go in there for survival. But we also get letters from former white supremacists who God got a hold of their heart. And, and I have uh, friends, they call themselves salt and pepper. He's white, she's black. It's a biracial couple who go into prisons, and, we, and we're going to be sharing their story in the next couple of issues. And dear, dear people, but he actually was very, very prejudiced about, toward black people, and God changed his heart. And, and I don't know how you feel about biracial marriages, but you know, a lot of times, and I don't even want to go down this tangent, but I remember being um, quoted this scripture that White people were not supposed to date black people because God says don't be unequally yoked. That is not what the Bible says. That is not what the Bible means. God wasn't saying a white person don't go marry a black person. He was saying don't be unequally yoked as God's people. Don't go intertwine the, the holiness of God with pagan traditions and a pagan land. Don't have interracial marriages because you're going to taint um, the holiness of God that God's called you to, and, and you're going to bring these evil pagan cultures into um, and dilute 
the um, holiness that God has called us to. That's what it was about. It wasn't about marrying. Now, there's cultural difficulties that make that might make it hard for a couple, but it is not prohibited in the Bible. And so there are things that we have been raised. And so we need to ask God to uncover those things, uncover the prejudice that's in us, uncover the hate that might be under there. Maybe you hate people who are homosexual that or have same-sex attraction. Maybe you hate them. I, I remember coming up, and I'm going to be honest with you. I'm just, just sharing my sin. And I was, I was driving down, I think it was Orange Avenue in Orlando about six months ago, and I came up on a very tall man in high heels and a mini skirt, and it was like nine o'clock in the morning, and I could just tell from his lifestyle, he's probably living on the streets, maybe a prostitute, I don't know, but at first when I was coming up, I had just disgust. I'm just going to be honest in my, I just was like, oh. How could they do that? But I caught myself and I said, God, forgive me and help me to love. And I, I'm telling you, the, as soon as I kind of got up on that person and looked in the rear view mirror and saw the pain on their face, God's love just swelled in my heart. And, and it was like a love for that community was developed in me that only God could give me. Because again, raised in the South, raised Southern Baptist and very um, strict um, Christian background. And so, and that I don't, I'm trying not to go too deep into anything because that's not the point. The point isn't about biracial marriages. It's not about same-sex marriages and, and all of that. The point is no matter where somebody is, no matter the color of their skin, no matter their lifestyle, we are called to love. And we are called to be salt and light to this world. We are called to work together as the body of Christ. And you may think, I have nothing to give. The Bible says we are all parts of the body. Even your little pinky, even your little pinky toe has a function of balance and grabbing things and holding things. And it's important. Go stump your little toe and tell me it doesn't hurt and it doesn't affect the whole body. It does. So you have a part to play. It may be on a large scale where, you know, you're ministering to millions of people. It might be you minister to one person consistently, but that person matters to God just as much as all the people that that other person's ministering. You make a difference. You need to acknowledge there's a problem. I need to acknowledge there's a problem. We need to acknowledge that we've been a part of the problem. We need to ask God to show us, God, what is my part of the solution? And say, God, I refuse to sit here any longer and do nothing. I refuse to sit and stay comfortable. I refuse to sit and just watch TV and never leave my home and do nothing. I refuse to be silent anymore. Not out yelling at people, but in love, maybe correcting people. When someone's saying a joke and perpetuating just bad humor that could hurt somebody, just lovingly say, you know, I, I just really don't want to hear that joke or leave. Walk away. Do something. Because, you know, if you watch a murder happen and you do nothing to stop it, you're an accessory to the crime. And it's the same way in prejudice and everything that's going on in this world. We have accessories all over. I've been an accessory. You've been an accessory. And it's time that we stop. So we ask to show us. So the Bible, again, back in Second Corinthians, Second Chronicles, 7, 14, he says, if you'll humble yourself, all that is the humbling process, and pray, pray. What does it mean to pray? It, it just is pouring your heart out to God. When I ask, you know, someone, would you like to pray? I don't know how to pray. Yes, you do. Can you talk? Can you, can you just say, God, hi. I'm here. 
I, I know this world's a mess and I know that I've been a, a part of the mess and I want to be a part of the solution, God. Would you show me how? Pray. God, would you help our world today? Pray. So if we humble ourselves and we pray and we would seek his face, seek his face, say, God, I want, I want to be where you are. I want to be your hands and your feet. I want to make a difference. Would you give me opportunities? He will. And start with what you see and what you can do, even if it's just smiling at someone that's different than you. Maybe develop a friendship. Maybe invite someone out to lunch. It's, it's not about you up here and them down here. It's about coming together as people and learning from one another because we all make each other better. Think about if you were married to someone identical to you. It would, it would not go well. God gives us diversity to make it beautiful. And that's one reason I picked our home church in Orlando at First Baptist Orlando. It's one of the most diverse churches in the world. And I love sitting there next to me. People have translation devices. I have an African-American man and couple in front of me. I have a Portuguese couple on this side. I have um, people from Cuba behind me. I have Chinese people on this side and Mexican people over here. And, and we're all worshiping together because you know what? When we get to heaven, there's not going to be this group of people over here and this group of people. God says all tribes and nations are going to come together. and We're going to worship the one true God who made us all. And so we are to humble ourselves. We are to pray. We are to seek his face and then turn from our evil ways. If we've been doing nothing, then we need to turn and do something. We are called to turn. And when we do that, here's what God promises to do. He says, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. He's going to forgive. He's going to hear us. He's going to forgive us. He's going to restore our land. He's going to restore our nation. We have a young girl from the Ukraine living with us right now. A young girl who has um, been an orphan her whole life. And um, I, I spoke to the orphanage uh, director, or not director, but her um, guardian over there. And I, I spoke with Natalia today and I said, um, she was concerned because she's watching the TV. And she's like, I would think that America would be the safest place to send one of our children, but we're, we're afraid for, for her. And I had to reassure her that we're okay that she's okay, she's safe. She's safe from the virus and she's safe from the rioting. But the reality is our world, our nation, not just our nation, but our whole world is a mess. But if we would do what God's called us to do and the change starts not just with holding a sign and protesting, I, there is a place for free speech and there is a place to stand. But there, the change won't come from a sign. The change is going to come from here. And if you read the account of Jesus coming upon the Samaritan woman, he loved on her and he spoke to her. And she was one, a woman, but also a Samaritan. And Jews did not speak to Samaritans. But Jesus did. Jesus hung out with the prostitute. Jesus hung out with the tax collectors, who back in that day were, were um, unethical people. He took advantage of people. If, if you read the account of the good Samaritan who took care of the, the man who had been beaten and stripped and robbed and all the priest would, the priest, he came by and he didn't help. The ones that should have helped did nothing. But then came along the good Samaritan who helped a man that it would be like a black and a white man helping each other. It would be like a, a Russian and a Ukrainian helping each other, a North Korean and a South Korean helping each other because they saw that it was a person in need. And we have a world filled with people in need. And God is calling us to action. He is calling us to move. He is calling us to more. It's not just more Monday tonight. It, it, we need more love every day. I, I, I know I'm probably going, I'm, I'm right at time right now, but I do want to go a couple more minutes if you'll just indulge me. And if you need to go, go and come back later. But I want to think about three reasons why 
we don't do something. Number one is we just don't care. And I hope that's, I don't think that's you. I don't think that's me. But reality is it is a lot of people. We just don't care. We don't care about the history of the suffering of black people. Maybe we just don't care about the suffering of Russian people all those years. Maybe we just don't care. I hope that's not the case. I hope that it's not the case. Another reason that we may not do something that we may refuse to move is because we don't feel like we're going to make a difference. Or maybe we don't know what to do. That's why we pray and we humble ourselves and God will show us. And we start just with little acts of kindness. And I've seen things make a huge, little things make a big difference. I remember being at a Ennis Wakes water sports outreach and we were working with all these children from Eastern North Carolina. And there was this young, um, young girl and she had just had her hair done and she had weaves and she did not want to get her hair wet. Cause she's like, it would undo the processing or whatever it is she had had done that day. She's like, or the day before she's like, I am not getting my hair wet. And I, and I Lord reminded me of a shower cap. That, that I had in my house, actually we were just visiting the house, the lake house, and it was a shower cap I had carried around with me for like four months from state to state to state. It was a free shower cap that I had gotten from a hotel. And I looked at this little girl and I remembered it and I said, if I brought you a shower cap and you could wear that and it would keep your hair dry, would you go? And she went. She ended up accepting Christ at the end of the day, and she stood up in front of all those people And because we give kids an opportunity to speak at the end of the day. And she says, ma'am, I just want to say, you're an angel. Okay, and I don't say that to say, oh, look at me, I'm an angel. No, I'm far from an angel. You can ask my kids, my husband, and my parents. But to her, I had done something so amazing. What had I done? I had taken a moment to care, to intervene and give this young girl something so that she could get off the dock, we call it, and go have fun. And it ended up changing her life because I knew if she got on the water, she would experience new emotions. She would experience new victories and she would understand a love um, from a stranger as we were out there helping her on the water. And I knew that that love that we extended to her could lead her to Christ, and it did. And so I know right now that you have a shower crap in your house. I know that you have a smile. I know that you have an encouraging word. I know you have something. If you're, walk, if you're watching this from prison, maybe you have an extra piece of chicken tonight. And I don't say that as a joke because I have read so many letters where people blessed other people with that extra piece of chicken they got. They've been waiting all week for that or a stamp or something from commissary because there's people all around it. They can't even buy a toothbrush at commissary in prison. And maybe you have some funds and you can help them. Maybe right now um, your neighbor needs something and you've got it. And we pray like I did and went to about my neighbor, God bless them. We say, God change our world. God bless them, bless them, help them. And God's saying, you bless them. You help them. So one reason we don't is because we just don't care. Number two is because maybe we don't think we can make a difference. It only takes a shower cap to make a difference. God will show you what to do. And whatever it is, the littlest thing can make the biggest difference in someone's life. I remember George Foreman. I used one of, I hope I get to meet George, big George one day. He's like one of my heroes. The way he came out of retirement boxing and, um, became a world champion at age 50. I just, I just love it. But what he said is when he was younger, he was cutting grass for this lady and she gave him $20 and she says, George, you did a great job. I'm proud of you. And he said, her looking me in the eye and saying that nobody had ever said that. And that, those words changed his life. And so after I read that in his book, God in My Corner, I made sure every time I go into prison and I shake someone's hand, I look them in the eye and I say, thank you for coming. 
God, is, God loves you. He's proud of you. I'm proud of you for coming tonight. You're going to do great things. And, you know, a lot of, I, there's a lot of controversy around Joel Osteen. I, I love Joel Osteen because he gives me an encouraging word. And, and those words can change a life. Recently, well, several months ago when I was in prison, I just went up to a man. I looked at him. I said, you're going to make it. And he wrote me later. He said, just you looking at me and saying, you're going to make it changed my life. I know you've got a word that you can give somebody. I know you've got a dollar maybe you can give somebody. A stamp you can give somebody. You can make a difference. The other reason, the third reason, I'm going to close with this, that we may not step out of our comfort zone is because we're afraid. And next week, we're going to pick up on losing the weight of fear. But if you get right down to it, if you're a white person, maybe you're afraid of a black person. If you're real honest. If you're a black person, I had someone tell me one time at one of our Innis Wakes events right here at Lake Christie, it was an African-American lady, and she said to me, I am so glad that you hold these water sports for these African-American children. She says, because when I was growing up, she says, I was taught not to go to the water because bad things happened at the water. The reality is at the water, black people were drowned by white people. And so she says, just the simple act of riding in the boat, water skiing, tubing, she says, it's breaking the fear off people. So maybe as a black person, you've been afraid to go to the water because you've been afraid of what might happen there. You've been afraid of, of that this white person would, would persecute you or, or look down on you. It's time to lose the weight of fear. Maybe you're a white person and, and because of differences in culture that you just don't understand, or maybe a Russian with a Ukrainian or whatever, that we've had these battles. I, I, I use that example a lot because I go to Russia. I have two Russian children. And I have a Ukrainian in my home and I've seen the battles there. God is calling us to, to be one people and to not be afraid of something different of someone different. Don't be afraid of what you don't understand. Just go understand it. And you'll be blessed by it. I just want to close with this last verse in Ephesians 2. And this this should seal the seal the deal for us. Um, Ephesians 2. Galatians, Ephesians. Here we go. Ephesians 2. For Christ himself is verse 14. I was looking down at the camera, sorry. <laughs> For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles. There were two separate people groups, and the Jews hated the Gentiles. The Gentile is just an, a non-Jewish person. Um, God, through Christ, he united them into one people when in Jesus' own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated Jews and Gentiles. He did this by ending the system of the law with his commandments and its regulations. He made peace between the Jews and the Gentiles by creating in himself. So in Christ, we are one new people from two groups. In God's eyes, we are one people group. He doesn't see skin. He doesn't see hair. He doesn't see language, shapes of eyes, shapes of noses, shapes of ears. He doesn't see anything but the heart. And that's, we need to ask God, God, give me your eyes for people and give me your love for people so that we can love our neighbor like you've called us to do. So like it says in, in John thirteen thirty four that we are above all to love, to love all people. The greatest commandment, to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love others as we love ourselves. Together as one body, Christ reconciled these groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. Jesus Christ ended division. So if there is division it's not because of something that was left unfinished by Jesus. It's because we are per perpetuating racism. We are perpetuating prejudice. We, we, and I know there's, there's a two separate words, and I remember there was a big difference between the two, but we, we are perpetuating being separate in our churches, in our denominations, in our world. 
And I believe with all my heart, it grieves the heart of God. So please refuse to just sit by comfortable anymore. Refuse to let other people say and do things that just grieve God's heart and that just plain aren't right. We're called to love mercy, to act justly, and to walk humbly before our God. And we are called to help the least of these, to help those that the world looks down upon. We are called to love. And love covers a multitude of sin and love casts out all fear. And if we walk in God's love, we will walk in unity and nothing will be able to stop us. And we will see this world change. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways. I will hear them. I will forgive them and I will heal their land. That's our verse for tonight. That's our verse for tomorrow and the next day. I pray this has been a blessing to you. I want to encourage you to go and, and listen to the song by Josh Wilson, I Refuse. I thought about that today as I was writing down God, I refuse to stay still, to stay silent, to stay comfortable any longer. I refuse. And that's what he says. He says, um, oh my gosh, I'm not going to sing it. Just go. It's in so many different keys. Go look it up. I refuse by Josh Wilson. Well, I love you. And I thank you for coming here tonight. I thank you for watching. I thank you for passing it on. And I just um, want to close in prayer and ask God to fill us with his love. So heavenly father, I come to you tonight and I am grateful for your spirit that help tonight that helped me just say, God, what I believe is on your heart. I thank you for the simple movie, Lorax, that reminded me, that quote of Dr. Seuss, that unless we start to care an awful lot about something, nothing will ever change. God, may every person on the other side of this video care. May I care to a new level. May we not sit still and just say, God, would you change our world? No, would we rise up, God, and would we be the hands and feet of Jesus? Would we be your voice? Would we be your love? Would we be salt and light to this dying, sick, hurting, broken world? God, that you would show us our part in the problem and show us our part in the solution. And I know it's very simple. We are called to love. We are called to be patient, according to Corinthians. We are called to be kind. We are called not to keep a record of wrongs. So that means if we have hurt people in the past, we're to forgive one another. If one race has hurt another race, we are to forgive one another. If you are a Jew, you're to forgive the German. We have got to forgive God. Help us to forgive. Forgive and to move forward in love. In your precious name we pray. Amen. I love you. I just want you to know that we're here for you. Call us if you need us, 352-478-2098. And if you're part of our inmate family and watching this, please reach out to us by mail. Uh, you can reach to Victorious Living Correspondence Outreach. That is mm, P.O. Box. Oh, my goodness. I do it every time. We're going to have it up on the screen for you. I think it's 986 Starks, Florida, 32091. So look that up. It's going to be at the end. Pat, you don't have to put that on there. He's moderating tonight. But we'll have it on the screen that comes up on your video. So God bless you and have a wonderful night. And go be the change this world needs. I love you. Bye-bye.